So here we are at the stage three in Port Arlington at the Bay Crits. Uh, I'm uh, narrating this from a hotel room sitting next to Pat Shaw and uh, from Avanti ISO Way Racing Team. Welcome aboard, brother. Yeah, thanks very much. So, um, mate, we've got the cameras on you here. We've just started the race. Little, little bit of a hill here. What was this like? Uh, yeah, this part of the course is always difficult. It's um, not only difficult because of the terrain, but also because of how um, technical the bottom corner is and the fact that you're approaching that bottom corner with such high speed. Um, and it's also probably the good launch pad for um, anyone that wants to try and make a breakaway. So they're all pretty much together at the back here. This was a bit of a headwind straight. It's sort of slightly uphill. And uh, you can see we've got the power there, so they're not really sort of going too hard here. Power's not really reflected there, probably because I'm protected out of the wind. But you can see now that I've hit the wind there, that's gone up pretty high pretty quick. Uh, it's a uh, false flat along that back straight, and the wind was howling. Uh, even here on the wheel, you can see it's three, four hundred watts, um, and that's getting a good sit too, good draft. Some big players in this race, Orca Green Edge there. We've got uh, State of Matter Map, so some good teams here. Drapacker there. That's uh, Sammy Spokes there on the left-hand side. So you're up the front, mate. Yeah, look, I always try to maintain good front position because you always know who's gone off the front in an attack, uh, how well represented you are with your teammates, but also you holding good bunch positions so that they can also move up the front, um, slot in in front or behind of you. Uh, usually that's the etiquette. If you've got a teammate there and you're trying to come in, uh, they'll, other teams will allow you that freedom. Um, and it's also a good uh, sign to send, uh, send your teammates that if you're up the front, it's a positive reinforcement that you're confident about how you're feeling for the day. You can see that I hold, hold pretty high cadence on this uh, course as well because um, it's a difficult course, but I ride probably 60% of this circuit in the small chain ring. Um, every single lap I rode small chain ring except for the last two laps on this hill. Um, and just so that when I do want to go to that big chain ring on those last laps that I've got more punch than my rivals. So there's a bit of an attack here up that hill. You guys were doing 30 k's an hour up that incline just then. Very high cadence uh, we could see but there was it was close to a thousand watts what are you weighing at the moment about 65 kilos so yeah a thousand watts would be is still at any time is a pretty big effort yeah. so big big attack there yeah this is a move this is a move I'm following um, uh, Bernard Sulzberger on the wheel here is not having much fun but neither was I trying to follow this move um, it's always a difficult time of the race. This it's early on in the race. I think we're on like lap three um, at this point. And the difficult thing is here is that you need to shut down these early moves, but you don't want to be using too much effort because you're going to pay for that later on. Um, and that's no matter how good your form is. Um, especially when you're racing against the caliber of athletes that Orica Green Edge have. Um, it's already, you're up against it before you start. Um, so handicapping it by making silly moves and wasting energy doesn't make it any easier. So an attack on the left-hand side there, one of your teammates, who's that, Pat Lane? Yeah, that's Pat, and I've and moved out a slightly there to shadow him so that riders further back than say sixth or seventh wheel maybe don't see his attack. Uh, that stops so many people responding to it, allowing him to get off the front a little bit um, faster and also stops the invigoration of the group. Um, so potentially allows him to have a breakaway that can survive a while. That way at least if the breakaway is not successful, he will have got out there and had time to settle into the rhythm of the break and also get his heart rate back down. So when we catch him, he'll still be able to maybe uh, potentially follow the next move. Um, rather than going off the front being caught straight away, being put back to 40th or 50th wheel and maybe even race over for the day. Um, difficult to come back from that 
far back, even at this early stage of the race. So I'm not sure if we've got anyone up the up the road, but it looks like everyone's sort of settled down a bit. There's Caleb there leading the um, the Bay Crit series. You can just see him through there in the yellow, the leader's jersey. You can see the riders that are um, quite confident, you know, sitting on top of the hoods in this area, but also the ones with higher cadence. Um, riders generally here that are riding at, at a low cadence are probably not going to be around at the end of this race. Um, and still early period, so you're going to see guys active that probably won't be at the end of the race either because this is the time they can be active if they're going to be. Um, the race sort of starts to heat up maybe uh, 20 minutes in. Um, but before that, everyone's sort of getting their feel for it. What are you doing here? Oh, you're just trying to go across. Yeah, there was a little move here and I was a little bit concerned about the numbers. Um, you can see this group's quite large and we were only represented with one rider and I wasn't really um, happy with that from a captain's point of view. Um, so I wanted to enforce that with uh, my representation. Um, didn't really work uh, because by representing as well here um, and being high up on the GC, Orica was um, really... Um, interested in shutting it down so we spent a fair few laps off the front here but it was really difficult to get these guys to cooperate um, I think it was Peter Koenig from Draypack in this move with me he um, was never interested in contributing at all uh, also Trav Meyer um, here he was voicing his um, dislike to uh, cooperating um, I think he was uh, a little bit tired at this point of the of the race but you can see even now um, when I come on to this group we'll see behind I think the group closes pretty quick here um, and that's going to be the end of our move uh, we had a relatively large gap and you can see how that's been absorbed really quickly on that hill um, and I wouldn't be surprised if the group probably was hitting uh, upwards of 36 kilometres an hour on the climb that time. Um, these are not speeds that uh, are, are unusual on this course. Uh, you can see another attack from our guys. <laughs> We've always been pretty active during the Bay Crits, but that's Robbie Hucker, so he's obviously targeting um, the, the Green Jersey competition um, to take points in the sprint competition. So. Oh, actually, he's just there, isn't he? So it must have been uh, Paddy Lane again. He's aggressive, Paddy Lane, isn't he? Yeah, and he's aggressive in a manner that's really disturbing to the opposition because it's at times where they want to relax. They've gone, finally, we've got a breath of, like, you know, relaxation. And then he goes. And they're the moves that really pay the toll because physically probably a lot of guys are up to it. You know, they're pretty even playing field. But mentally is where it sort of comes through. Again, Pat's just come back and you can see already active movement by Robbie there. And these types of things like that, you can't teach riders. That's um, natural intuition that he's learned through cycling um, intelligence, cycling IQ we call it. Um, and Robbie's actually a really special um, rider in that sense that he's pretty much a complete package in the sense that he has a good punchy acceleration. He's light so he can climb, but he's just a really intelligent rider too. He thinks about his energy use, but he also thinks about when to attack. That was a really good time to attack. Um, and you can see now I'm sort of just trying to linger around the front, stop too much cooperation going on, um, to allow him again a good time out in front to settle down or potentially stay away. Um, and this, this group that did form here, this little break off the front, um, did stay away for quite a while. Um, and in quite a while, that could only be two or three laps, but that's a long time in this type of circuit. And that's a lot of energy that other teams are using to chase him back. Um, and Robbie, in, probably in this circumstance, although he was going for sprint points, he's actually probably in the back of his mind more thinking about how much can I make other teams suffer to make that a negative experience for them, but a positive experience um, and, and outcome for his teammates, um, for our team. So. These are all things that experienced and smart bike riders are thinking while they're racing. Um, it's not just a go out there and ride hard and hold max wattage for as long as you can or, or good power. 
it's what is this power doing to other riders? Is this doing damage more to me than anyone else? Then that's ineffective. If it's hurting me more than anyone else, I want my teammates to be getting an easy ride. Here, Pat Lane keeping good bunch position. Um, this is vital because it gives you that first port of call if an attack is to come, but he also controls the rhythm here. You can see you'll back it off into the corner a little bit. Just comes out of that corner easy. So that bunches the group up, which stops that flow through the corner to get a fast, easy attack. We'll still see moves come here. That's standard. We expect those to come, so we're ready for those. Ooh, and you'll see, jumped straight on it. Yeah, that's, that's a great thing. But you'll see here, I just wait until, okay, they're still a little quick, but now jump in. Robbie's my teammate. I'm behind him. We're in a good position now. Paddy's at the front. I'm behind Robbie. So if we want Robbie to go, I can sort of follow him but not try to hold his wheel and that lets him get a gap. Um, this is a very difficult corner um, technically and you can see people struggle with it every lap. Worst thing is if you're struggling with that corner you're not having any momentum into this climb and generally guys are riding big chain rings up here and I'm one that says ride the gear that suits the course not the one that suits your uh, ego. So. <laughs> I spend a lot of the time in the small chain ring, um, which on this day uh, probably comes to fruition. Again, here you'll see that sometimes my wattage is quite high, but at times I'm actually riding a really low wattage. Um, and you'll see like this is a tough period, we've had an acceleration there, but more than likely on this next section you'll see a lot of below 100 watts uh, coming up. Um, this is actually a pretty solid piece here, isn't it? Uh, but now 90 watts, 80 watts, nearly zero. A little bit of an acceleration here, um, heading into the downward left-hand bend before the uh, for the final straight. Again, low power heading into the corner as well. Still quite high speed. Um, you know, it's a difficult corner, but we're still taking that at 38 k's an hour. Um, try to take your local roundabout at 38 k's an hour. <laughs> it's not real easy to do, but that's um, that's saying that we are trained to do. Um, and tyre pressure is a big part of that. Uh, a lot of people think more pressure, faster, but definitely less control. And I probably didn't do any of these bay crits with um, three figures in the tyres, so never 100 psi. Really, uh, that's that's so interesting. So what what sort of psi were you putting in? Uh, I like to keep that a little bit. That's I don't care about data. I release data openly. I don't really care about that. And my training, Ooh. yeah, you can see that was a close one there. He nearly uh, went down then. And that's probably tyre pressure, to be honest. Um, but I don't talk. I, I just say that I've always been a fan since I come to Avanti Ice Always Sports um, Cycling Team five years ago of riding lower pressure, and it's come with great rewards. So I do recommend trying a bit lower pressure, maybe five percent lower, and just see how you find it. But I actually would probably say for um, the everyday cyclist out there just wanting to go for a ride, um, training, even if it's not for racing, just for general purpose, recreational or club style racing, just train on 100 PSI for a while and see um, how you go, but um, you'll probably get better wear out of your tyre too. Yeah, right. Very interesting. I better stop putting 140 psi in my tyres. Well, I haven't seen 140 psi since I rode double discs on the track. <laughs> <laughs> so you're running a, a bike shop in Ballarat as as well? Yeah, we yeah. have a family business in Ballarat, so um, I think that's a good thing. I get uh, interaction with um, the everyday bike rider, whether it be on a mountain bike commute type bike or on a road bike and they're just doing it recreationally or club level or um, maybe veterans at an open level. Um, so I, I talk to all levels of cyclists and I understand all levels of cycling. Um, I always competed at a high level for a long time, but we all begin as a club rider. Um, and even when you're a professional cyclist, you have days where you feel like you're a club rider. <laughs> so you feel like you've only been doing 100 k's a week and it really hurts more than you've ever hurt before. So 
I understand the sensations that the, um, each different uh, type of cyclist goes through and what they want to get out of it too because not everyone obviously wants the super peak performance but um, this Ooh, is a crash, a crash. yeah this is a crash so that's it that was um, Jack Haig there I think um, he wouldn't like me mentioning that but um, yeah he's um, he gets up and comes back into the race and does another great performance he rode well all week yeah, he did a. He, I think he was in the next move, wasn't he? Uh, no, I think that was Luke Durbridge. That, oh, was it? Uh, probably headed off the front soon. But um, we'll see that uh, not long after this, we'll probably see another fall. Um, bit of an interesting one it was, actually, because I was right behind it. So we'll get a good view of that, um, my teammate, actually. And. Uh, It'll be good when we get the footage of that. I'll talk you through what we're actually doing because it was a bit of a tactical move, um, but then we probably were going a bit quick for the corner. So um, here, what we see, you can see the red jerseys here of their teammates just attack. So they're trying to flood the front of the bunch, if you like, make it wide so it's impossible to pass, or it's uh, disinteresting to riders further back because they think of the energy expenditure that's going to be uh, required to make a move. So now that's allowed that group to string out. Um, mind you, that's been a pretty positive uh, move from the group. Someone's not interested in uh, that group going away. Probably probably Orica. Um, obviously with Caleb Ewan, they're very happy to go into any sprint situation. Um, and I would be too. We can still see, we're still hitting this corner. Around that 35, 38 k's an hour uh, mark. Mind you, Early on, the pace is a bit slower into that corner. I'm not really taking the risks into that corner. It's not really important to do that at that point of the race. Um, I don't want to be crashing because of pushing for one percenters after 10 minutes of a criterium that's one hour long. Um, willing to take the risks at the end when it's on the line, but before that, trying to probably uh, minimize those type of risks is important. That's a good move there by Neil. You'll see he puts the pressure on here, but then gets stalked. And that's where I tell uh, Steele to go. Steele's going to actually fall in this corner. But you can see from my rear view camera uh, that the gap is opening up quite substantially. And then Steele goes down and I just miss him. Full front brake. Wow. Now we had a good gap there, but I've sat up immediately. You can see my wattage drop considerably. And that's because I had to cut my losses. We had a good uh, positive move. But because of the crash, it's no longer a positive move. So I've decided to stop, uh, go back to the group, and then there'll be another opportunity later, we hope. Well, that was incredible. It was so bizarre. The top of the hill. Yeah, but there's a little bit of a cutout on that corner. It's like a little pothole. Um, it has been filled, but it's still got an edge on it. And I think he just clipped the edge of that. And I knew it was happening. I could see um, it were going to happen and then I also already responded but I still thought I'm probably going down here it's not ideal not ideal but sometimes there's nothing you can do and you've got to just accept that um, it's an occupational hazard people fall off and sometimes you hit other people sometimes you make mistakes um, it's never good when it happens to you it's never good when it happens to anyone but it is an occupational hazard and as professional athletes it's saying that we sort of have to suck up um, and then just try and get ourselves back out there. And still also, like Jack A, gets back up and um, will complete um, the rest of the race. You can see here quite a lot of energy being expended on this straight. When you're on the front coming into this corner, the momentum that you um, continue with out of, the, out of the corner gives you such an advantage to string the field out. And even that little bit of hesitation coming around the corner behind one rider still means you're probably putting out in excess of 200 watts more to get back onto behind those riders in front of you. Um, and how many laps? I think it was 28 laps. So 28 efforts like that does really take its toll um, later in the race. You can also see, like, guys... Not only do the guys that crash, do they get affected uh, confidence-wise going into these corners now, but also the other guys who were around them that had close calls probably are thinking, geez, he crashed, I could do that too. Um, I don't really bother myself too much with that. I try and back my intuition uh, with my cornering. 
And more importantly, I try to go around guys in the bunch that I know corner similar to myself so that we're taking similar lines into the corners, um, which means I'm not worried all the, all the time and I'm not grabbing a lot of break late uh, when cornering. Because grabbing break actually straightens you and then uh, makes it difficult to respond. Now here, I already had a teammate responding here with uh, Pat Lane, but it was an attack that I didn't really want to use too much energy at this point of the race. Um, you can see Caleb on behind me here. Um, usually me behind him, but... Um, that's a good sign. If the yellow jersey's following you a little bit, you know that you're probably doing the right thing. We can see there's a good group off the front here. Um, I'm pretty sure we ride across to this. Um, I think Caleb ended up doing the bulk of the work here, actually, because Brenton Jones represented in this move, if I remember rightly. So I sort of knew at that point when Brenton represented, Caleb has to represent now. Uh, Brenton's second on the GC. Caleb's third. Uh, first, should I say, easily. Um, yeah, it's close. It looks closer on the camera. Um, but this is what we react to this sort of movement all the time. And, and later in the race, we'll see more and more uh, close racing going on. Um, the closer we get to the finish, the more one percenters come into play. Um, now, this corner, you probably see the momentum that we take into it. I'm backing off a bit here off the wheel because I know I'm coming into this corner quicker than him. And you'll see I come in under him there. And that means now, if he wants to accelerate past me, he's gonna have to use quite a lot more energy. I'm already doing that five, six, 700 watts. But if I hadn't come into the corner with that momentum, I'm probably doing more like 850, 900 and also probably about 15 revs per minute less. Uh, still high cadence there, 120, 110. Trying to keep the legs fresh. Didn't feel nice on the heart rate though. <laughs> it uh, does ask a lot out of you, but physically the legs just stay a lot, um, a lot um, less fatigued. Um, and, and my teammates hate it because I'm always saying up, up the gears, up the gears, pedal more, pedal more. Um, especially in this early part of the season when you're still relatively fresh, it's not a, not a hard thing to do, maintain high cadence, but definitely in the months of October, November, um, the body's got tired from a long season. Your cadence is dropping considerably. Uh, Someone from V2 attack there. Yeah, there's plenty of moves going here because the you, this is where there's a bit of chat going on the bunch. You're not really probably hearing a lot of it, but um, guys are starting to try and get in each other's head a bit. Like, oh, it's really hard out here, isn't it? If it continues like this, there won't be many finish, that kind of chat. Also, oh, I reckon the next one's going to go, and that would mean the next break is going to be successful by winning the race. So that gets in people's heads too, and it gets people active. Um... The main thing for me in these circumstances is always to um, assess every move on its merit. Uh, if I think it's if I think it's dangerous, I'll close it straight away, or hopefully a teammate will be involved. Um, but we'll assess that on a level of our team's objectives for the day. Um, again, in these criteriums, though, it's difficult to try and control too much because um, just of the flow of the circuits. Um, and the energy expenditure required to stay at the front is already quite considerable. So um, when moving up here, you're going to be using a lot. You can see that one's another close one to the barricades. Ooh, you just <laughs> and you can see the momentum he's lost. Now, he's definitely riding in a big chain ring there. I'm riding small chain rings. So I've come around with momentum, but then maintained pretty good. And that's high power. This moves. that's a serious move that's gone there. You can see that gap's opened up. But that gap opened up, not because of the power, but because of the poor cornering by that rider there. And that's really backed everyone else off. Um, and they're not expecting that. Now he's done, look at the big effort he's done to ride on. Now he's fixed that problem, but that price, I don't think we see that rider probably much later than this, because that is a huge effort to make on this circuit at that time. When I think we're nearly at halfway point. So we've been racing for about 28 minutes. So what I suppose what you're saying is he's exerted energy that he doesn't need to. It takes him a little while to recover. And on a circuit like that, you can't go into the red too often. No, well, if you have a look too, he came on with such momentum. 
Why do you come onto the back of the bunch doing 10 kilometers faster than the bunch? Back off earlier and just roll into the back of the bunch. Yeah, if it's probably 15% less um, for 15% less time, um, and that's considerable. Now, it could be argued that you went under him and slightly chopped him. What yeah. do you think? Well, it could be argued, but it could also be that his momentum wasn't good enough to go through that corner. Um, so, as much as it can be argued that the person coming from behind is um, is chopped, yep, there was never a touch of riders. So, it's also the nerve of the rider that's being um, undertaken. So, if you're being undertaken by a rider and you get nervous about it and back off, you're going to lose a lot more ground than what if uh, you um, control your nerve and and actually keep the power down. Another good capture here of a teammate behind me here. So it's important to stick around your teammates. We're big on it. Um, that's Chris Hamilton. So young up and comer, and um, you know he's proven himself. So calling him an up and comer is a bit rough, probably. Um, but he's still so young um, that. What is he capable of doing um, in the long run? It's hard to say. I think he'll be phenomenal, to be honest. Really? Yeah, and we'll see that later on in this criterion at just the calibre of athlete he already is. Um, so you think he'll go, go on to bigger and better Oh, things? for sure. And um, it's fantastic to have the ability to work with that level of athlete when he's that young. Um, because you know what he's capable of doing in the future and you hope that we play a big role in that. So we're just chilling out here, actually. This is probably the period of the race where I'm starting to think about this has been a very tough day already. We're halfway through, almost. We're coming around to get start lap 14. We complete 28 laps for the entire race. I'm starting to think now, everyone's a bit tired. Now is probably the most important part of the day of worrying about how much energy I'm using and when I'm using it. I only want to be using energy when other people are. Um, and consuming fluid um, and also my gels um, is vital. So um, we're really lucky to have a, a very good quality nutritional company, ISO Sports, sponsoring us and I know the effect that its products have had on us, they're fantastic. Um, but you can see the bike behind me is my teammate, he's got two bottles in. Most of our competitors today, if you have a look around, only have one. Um, now I started with two, I threw one uh, midway to our uh, staff members and um, they picked that up of course. And then, um, but I had two biddens on this day, and to, our performance reflects that in the final stages of this race. Looking after ourselves on a nutritional level, I believe is uh, more vital than any of the training that goes on leading into the event. Um, and I remembered on yesterday's stage, on Monday, that um, many guys were complaining about cramping, and they said, oh, do you have any issues with cramping? Uh, I was like, well, no, we've got the best uh, nutrition supplier in the, in the world, in my mind. Um, and we didn't, but we also consume more fluid. Um, saying that, fluid and, and uh, nutritional products can be difficult to consume on hot days like this. Um, another advantage of our company that supports us is that it's consumable easily, uh, which allows us to have the energy to perform at a high level. Um, again here, we've got Neil on my wheel, so a teammate. Um, and you feel secure around your teammates, that's what they're meant to be, they're meant to be your, your mates, so um, you can trust them, uh, have confidence in them. Chris Hamilton's then on Neil's wheel, so we're actually lining up, and I think I saw the green jersey there behind Chris, so Robbie Hacker. So we're actually fully lined out here, um, which is great representation, 14 laps into a 28 lap race. It shows that we're all on good legs. We're all uh, capable of sitting around each other and we can communicate effectively. Um, obviously no radio, so we have to communicate vocally um, by shouting or riding up beside each other. And as you can see, like with the wattage we're putting out, riding beside each other isn't real easy. <laughs> so communication becomes something that is uh, minimal 
but it needs to be effective communication when we have it. So um, we do a lot of work on not so much code words, but short, sweet, precise language. Um, and, it, and it's effective. Um, and it, uh, you always have days where you have a mix up. Someone says no and they go or go and they think it's no. So we change that to different words. Uh, and when there is a mix up, we accept that the person saying it has not said it clear, but also the person reacting has only heard what he's heard. So he can only do what he thinks he's heard. And so there's no um, malice there or, or um, disappointment on either side. It's just another learning curve. And even when you get it perfect, you're gonna make mistakes. Um, and so, that's that's part of it. So you're going to close, or you are closing this gap here. So yeah, this particular one, uh, I probably don't know. I can't remember why I closed this. Um, really, I had Robbie Hucker there, so I probably didn't need to do that. But maybe I was testing the legs at that point. Um, I do like to do that as well. I do like to, if I've because I had a fair bit of time in the wheels in this last probably five six laps. Um, oh, that's why. Caleb's there as well. Um, so there's pretty big names there. I'm happy with Robbie being there, but I prefer to be there to reinforce him. Yeah. Um, so now seeing the riders that are there, that shows me why I probably closed that down. Um, so it, as much as you trust your teammate, you really want to be there together to reinforce each other because if Robbie or I have bad legs, like here you can see Robbie um, has then said to me, you've got to go, so I've gone here. Uh, and that's a situation you can have, but if I wasn't close to him, we can't communicate that. Then what happens is we've got a group here away, six riders, win, none in it. Uh, and no representation is the worst representation you can possibly have, uh, because all onus goes on to you to chase it back, and you can see, look at the work being done here behind. Like, that is burning huge amount of energy, like massive energy. Um, and that's going to pay a big price at the end of the race, no doubt. Um, and this group's not going to survive. This is not going to be the winning move. And you know it when you're in it. You're in this move, you're going, okay, we're here, we're represented. That's the important thing. We're not yeah. thinking about, yeah. oh, who's winning this race now? Because we know this is not going to survive. Yeah, so I get what you mean. You, you sort of have to be have someone in everything and in case it does go. Yeah, everything probably to an extent backwards just a little bit, about 5% decrease. There's some moves that just are not worth representing in. This particular one is a strong move um, in the sense that the effort being um, put in is high. And you can see there's a fair few people getting involved. And um, I, I can't remember what the situation was exactly here, but I know that I was pretty calm about this group going away. I think there's far too many good guys sort of get together they're not going to work um, all that well. Here, I'd probably be saying to Neil, just back it off a bit. Paddy Lane's gone. That's perfect. We're going to slot in on this next group of riders. So Caleb's now had to respond. Um, so that's a good time for me to follow too. I know where Caleb's going to be, and that's front group. Um, so when he moves, and you can see that's uh, BJ. He's um, second overall. And probably already at this point, he's starting to struggle a bit on this circuit. It's not really his forte, this type of terrain, um, which was uh, which is good for us because Straypak invested a lot of energy in him on this circuit, um, and he wasn't able to to finish in that front section. You've got to be careful when you're following a guy like Caleb. This is why I don't like to follow him too much in these types of circuits because he's got too much acceleration. He hasn't lengthened out too much there, but he could probably make me pay quite a bit for sitting on him. Doesn't have a good draft because he's low, um, but his acceleration is in incredible as well, and I can't respond to that. So I try to stay away from him on this type of course because he's only going to make me consume energy that I don't want to. So I stay around more guys that are similar type riders to myself in today's race. So. A lot of time with my teammates, but if not my teammates, probably around guys that, um, you, you know, like a Lee Howard, um, who can ride good cadence, but also maintains really good bunch position. So I, so I know that even if I'm in a little bit of trouble, 
and I want to, like, let's say that I'm using a lot of energy, I'm quite tired, I'm breathing high, heart rate's high, so my concentration level drops. I sit around a guy like Lee Howard because I know he will respond correctly to certain circumstances that I reckon I'd probably respond similar. So then what I do is for a couple of laps, I probably just respond like he does. I don't actually make my own choices. I decide to put my fate in him for a couple of laps, and two laps later, I'll be a lot fresher for that. Um, and on this particular day, it kind of worked well. Uh, but this headwind, you can just see, this is Jack Haig. Now, Jack Haig is extreme high-level athlete, world-level athlete. Um, what he's done there is back the pace down, the group also backs down, and then he's just accelerated quickly onto the back. And you can see the string out, strung out effect that it's had. However, I already knew what he was doing before he was doing it. So when he started to slow down, I was already going to a higher um, gear, easier to push, so that I could accelerate with him. Um, and then you can see here, I've got the freshness from that to follow this move. Um, which I wouldn't have had if I didn't know that he was making that move down the back straight. Um, don't know who that was, maybe Alex Edmondson there. Um, but I've gone straight over the top, just to keep the pressure on a bit here. I think this whole time, there's a rider still away solo this whole time. Um, and so, I probably shouldn't have done this effort to be honest. It's probably a bit of a waste of energy. but. Um, at the time, when you're in the mix of it, it all makes sense. <laughs> um, and I'll probably assume that I'll come through this corner and probably pull to the left-hand side of the road to allow... I'm um, oh, still lengthening it out. Um, but I, I probably really don't want to be too much part of this. I think I actually dragged away Robbie Hucker here as well. This end, ended up being a pretty solid group. But again, um, it's a move that's not winning this bike race. And that's the difficult thing. This is quality athletes we're working with here, but we're not winning the bike race in this move. But it's an important part of the race that we continue to put the pressure on so that the people back in the group at least have to work hard to catch us so that they've exerted a similar amount of energy of what we have to actually initiate this break. Um, you can see... What you'll see in this next lap or so is the lack of cooperation from anyone except my teammate, Robbie Harker. So you can see uh, Jack Haig's not interested. He knows that you've got two guys from our team here that are quick. Um, the Draypack rider here, he's not interested. He's got Brenton Jones second on GC. He doesn't want me moving over the top. And then you're going to see a good discussion I'm having here going, well, I can't be giving you the sit all day. It's not a, a charity ride time for you to to put a bit of effort into if you want to get a result out of this event you need to put in effort too they don't want to so i've upped the pace and this change of pace you hope will convince them maybe it's just easier if i swab off then i'm controlling my rhythm rather than following accelerations all the time uh, impressive move coming from behind here uh, um, that's uh, Neil Vanderplug from our team um, and also um, another young rider from uh, Physio Health. He's come across as well. Um, and at this point I didn't know they were there. So I've rolled off here and I'm sort of having a bit of words to say like, calm guys, what level athletes are we? Are we going to really have a go or are we just rolling around? Um, again, it's a use of language that you trying to get them motivated. Um, because we still know we're not staying away, but we still want the group to work well. If we all work well together, the group's going to have to work from behind a lot harder to bring us back. And if they're working a lot harder to bring us back, they're going to be more fatigued. And um, But in hindsight, we're probably over-represented here. We've got three riders in six, um, of which the other three riders that aren't us are not interested in working anyway. Um, not a good group to be in. Yeah. You want a group that's going to cooperate. So here, um, Neil and uh, Robbie actually do a real bulk of the work here. I'm still sitting back here trying to work things out. I'm thinking, well, this is positive. We've got three guys here, but if we're going to survive, one of us needs to stop working hard. And who's it going to be? And my first port of call is which one of them is going to stop working hard because I would generally say, I'll do the job. Um, 
But at this point, I'm sort of thinking to myself, I don't really want any of us three working hard because I still don't believe this is the move that'll survive. Um, and we've got a really good gap here. Um, there's no one in sight, but then just in the turn of three corners, we will be caught. And that's the whole thing. So I knew we weren't going to stay away. Didn't want to waste energy on this move. But we're not communicating so much because I'm only passing Neil there. And you can see that's the first time I've passed him since probably a minute 30 previous. Yeah. So there's a minute 30 there, no communication. I can't tell him, you're wasting energy or I don't think this is a good move. Um, but yeah, so we're just tap tapping along here. So it's interesting. You're um, you've got a you know quite a good representation in this group. There's I think there's two or three of yous. I just find that uh, I, I I would in my club racing scene I'd sit, be sitting there going, let's go boys, you know. Yeah. So yeah. it's interesting <laughs> that you're actually thinking quite the opposite. Well, because you have to be mindful of the and respectful of the guys that are behind. They're not um, your Sunday pub crawlers. They're legitimately good bike riders and so they're not just letting us ride away we're not just gonna go and win this race take it off them like candy from a kid we're gonna have to work really hard you can still see they're not in sight but the problem is you can see uh, Jack Hague is staying on my wheel here but the rest of those guys were dagging off so they're already fatigued um, and on this course especially in this wind the amount of effort that's going to be required is way more than two riders can contribute. So we can never go along at it at our, at our own. Um, so we really need to keep the group motivated. And even if we get caught, but we expend 20% less energy, well, that's better than staying away and then getting beaten by these guys because they've sat on us the whole day. Um, this is me overtaking Neil, mainly overtaking him because I wanted him to stop working so hard um, so I've just gone to the front and here you can see 23k an hour 300 watts <laughs> so pretty difficult and and that was the sensations it was just horrific up that back straight um, hotter conditions than was expected and right here I think I took a look back and I think we're being caught um, pretty soon um, the group is hunting down on us from behind. Another discussion I've had with this guy, same as I had with another uh, chap earlier, was that, you know, you've ridden all the way over to this break, and now you want to sit on the back. It's not really the way it functions. Um, you can get yourself a result, but you need to contribute, otherwise we're not going to stay away. Still knowing that I knew we're not staying away anyway, um, but important for them to know that potentially if they work, we could stay away. I'm factoring that he's not going to work, neither is uh, probably the other guys um, that aren't from our team. So just while this is going on, one thing I wanted to ask you, you know, for, for the, the cyclists in C grade and D grade, learning how to come up through the grades, you know, what sort of training, what would be like a typical two month training block for, for people, what, what would you recommend they would do to sort of bring themselves up well? I think if you're like a three, maybe four day a week rider, um, even if you're two or three day a week rider, I think one of those days has to be really quite light on fatigue, but it mainly has to be, that day has to have a bit of content to it, so a bit of length, a bit of loading. And then on two of the other days, if it's not a race day, you need to try and emulate the type of things that you're going to have sensations that you'll have in your event. Now in a C and D grade, obviously the power doesn't go down for as long or probably as hard as what it does in these events. But you can definitely do similar type of effort on your own. So if you know in your race, generally when it's hard, it's hard for 30 seconds. Well then you need to go and do 35 second efforts at that same work rate. And you'll find that you'll improve out of that grade. And then when you move into the next grade, it might be a lesser power for a longer time. So then do that type of effort. Especially at a club level, I think it's important that you focus primarily on your particular type of racing. For us as professional athletes, it's a bit different because we're racing a crit um, around uh, Eastern Beach, which is flat on day one. 
Then we're racing an undulating course on Eastern Park day two. Then we come here, super windy, uphill, very difficult, steep hill um, on day three. So three very different circuits over three days. So we have to train a lot of different systems um, physically. But in review of uh, the data that I took during all four stages of uh, the Bay Crits, my energy zones I used, recovery, endurance, anaerobic, VO2 max, were almost like 30 seconds within each other for every day. So recovery zone actually nearly 30 minutes of every day, which is probably a bit surprising, but I suppose you're freewheeling into corners. Yep. Um, and the highest zone after that was probably anaerobic for about 12 to 14 minutes of each day. Right. So they're the, the systems that you're using predominantly. And yep. then about three to five minutes spent in your other four zones. So yep. it shows you there's an even spread, but your two biggest zones you're probably using in these races is recovery and anaerobic. Right. So, you know, there's a lot of talk about um, in the old days, you know, we used to go out and we used to, get, you know, do 200k rides, mm. you know, four to five to six hour yeah. rides regularly. Yep. And then these days, there's a lot of talk from coaches about, oh, that's, you know, um, what is it, uh, wasted kilometres, you know. Yeah, trash I mean, k's. Trash k's. I still personally believe in those big k's for, bring, you know, early season. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts? Uh, my mindset's changed a lot over the years. I think um, I think you definitely need to do kilometres at some point to build up the capability to have the endurance um, there. But once you've got it to a certain point, I believe it only needs to be refreshed. So maybe occasionally doing a big ride. Um, but I've probably done five to 600k weeks for about six weeks leading into this. It's not like I've been out doing 1,000k weeks, 250k rides, anything extreme like that. However, now with the Pioneer power meters, we're able to monitor all of our training to precision. So we have accurate, precise, um, functional training every day. Everything makes sense and we do it for a reason. And so we train less uh, less kilometres, but probably a lot more content to our rides. So we know we want to spend it exactly 15 to 20 minutes in this particular zone. And we want to do this effort and this effort at this particular time of a day of, a, of training ride. Um, whether it be the last hour of a five hour ride, or whether it be the first hour of a five hour ride, they're completely different. So we know what is being set out. Um, and we've got, we use today's plan, uh, which has a great um, platform for uh, measuring our data. Um, What's it called? Today's plan. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's an online, a bit like Training Peaks, but a lot easier to use. Um, and more functional, I think, for especially your everyday rider. But it's been a fantastic platform for us as professional athletes um, to measure long-term and short-term gains so um, together with pioneer power meters and today's plan we've been able to do that um, do you ever get on you ever, boys ever get on zwift no i'm not a big fan of that yet maybe in retirement i reckon <laughs> <laughs> well, I, have a, I reckon it's more like a bit of cappuccino time and go for a pedal uh, yeah, then yeah. sort of get indoors um, but yeah, like there's a lot of technical aspects that I suppose we probably could talk about. And we spoke about tyre pressure before, but also uh, depth of rim is important. Um, today's race and all of the Bay Crits, and you can see Caleb Ewan using the Durace C50s as well. We use the Shimano wheel sets. Um, in this particular race, I was um, using the C50s. And I find them fantastic. They're a bit wider berth on the rim as well. So you can put a bigger tire on there, like 24 mil, which is why I ran in this event. Uh, meaning I can run a lower pressure, but also maintain a really good level of grip and also momentum. Um, and that shows you that a good quality wheel can also assist you a lot. So stiffness through these corners, which is allowing me to take the corners at a high speed. But some people are running lower profile wheels they're probably not getting as much speed out of the corners as I am, so they're working harder. And then you've got other people that are riding a deeper dish wheel, and the wind's grabbing that a fair bit through the corners, but also probably a lot of vibration going through those, so not a correct wheel set for um, this particular um, stage of the Bay Crits. Yeah, right. 
And it's, um, it's interesting because a lot of people talk about like carbon wheels. You know, everyone wants carbon wheels. Yeah. Um, and everyone knows the major brands. But there's a huge difference between one set to another, and people are kidding themselves if they're not. And um, I've ridden a lot of sets over the years. And I reckon the biggest thing for me um, is their ability to maintain good braking ability. And that's something that I've really loved about the Shimano wheel sets is that even after a season of racing, we ride these wheels in the Bay Crits and we go into corners and there's no grub, no grabbing, no vibration, which allows you confidence in and out of the corners. What about the tw- 25mm thickness tyres versus yeah. 23 versus 19? Well, like I said, 24 was what I ran on this particular race. Yeah. Um, I've been a big fan of 25, 24s. Um, but if you're running a skinnier rim, I think 23 is probably not a bad option as well. Um, you got to think about aerodynamics as well. So, um. so we're coming in. We got uh, this is lap 24 of 28. This is we're coming yeah, into the final. It's getting juicy. We got the breakaway as well. So Durbridge is up the front. Oh he, yep, yep. He, he won this circuit a couple of years ago. I ran second to him. Uh, he's up there with Miles Scotts and another great time trials. We know this is the time to react. And we have a man in the move. So Chris Hamilton has just made contact with this front breakaway. And an exceptional ride it has been for him to do that. And now that has put pressure on Orica Green Edge to bring it back. Because they now know Chris Hamilton's not only ridden across to the break, but he's sitting on now. Because he doesn't want to worry about riding them to the finish. If he gets the finish, he wants to win. Um, and he's got an extremely good strike rate. Now uh, He's national under 23 criterium champion, so... This is his business. Um, that and doing monos. If you have looked at some of the videos online, the boys did some mono um, demonstrations before the start of this stage, um, showing that they're not just uh, a one a one string guitar. See the guys here all bunching up behind me, and I'm, I remember at this point looking back a few times and just the confidence it gave me, knowing my teammates were all banked up behind me, knowing. All right, if I go early, they're going to be there. Or if something's coming from behind, they're going to give me alert that it's coming. And they're also protecting me. Um, so by having my teammates behind me, it's making me further away from other teams. So rather than teams being on my wheel and having the sitting shot, they're actually five or six lengths behind. So it makes them hesitant to, to make moves. Yeah. Um, I, I stay heavily on Caleb here because I'm sort of still in the mindset that Orica's running a bit low on men here, and Caleb may just try to slingshot himself across. And if he does, I'm going to have to react probably before he does it, because his acceleration is going to gap me severely. Um, And that's a respect side. I've got to understand I'm not uh, a world tour sprinter, and he is. And so I need to react before he actually does his movement. Um... It's interesting. Uh, what's his fellas here? Robbie it's, Hucker. So Robbie Hucker just had something to eat. Yeah, gel. Three laps to go. Yeah. He's still eating, still drinking. Yeah, it's a smart move because he knows also that tomorrow's another crit and he needs fuel for tomorrow. And he knows that probably he's going to be riding back to Geelong after this stage for his preparations for the national championships. So he wants fuel in for that as well. Um, so that's smart. That's really smart. I'm probably not consuming a gel this late myself. I'm not riding back to Geelong. Um, so I've consumed a gel at the 20 minute mark and 40 minute mark, yep. knowing that they'll get me to the 60 minute mark and probably within 20 minutes of that finish, I'm needing a feed. But I would probably straight after the finish have a, um, a, a, a whey protein um, supplement uh, straight after the shake. And um, again, that's like the carbon wheels. There is such a gap between a quality whey protein and just the off-your-shelf. So three, they just got the three laps to go. Three Uh, laps to go here. I'm starting to think result now. This is what I'm starting to think. I'm starting to think, how do we get the result we want? I get bombed here by this guy. Um, He tries to overtake and then realizes, yeah, no, they're going through the corner pretty quick. I might stay back here. Um, and you'll see see how quick my teammates come back into position behind me. That's to say, right, well, you got it past us. But you only got past two of us. Pat's still in front. We're going to go back to his wheel. 
You can see the power is quite high here. Um, so who's on the? Oh, Alex, right. Alex Edmondson's right in the front here at this point, and he'd ridden already for a few laps, so he's starting to fatigue. But so is anyone ten wheels or further back. So I've got a really good ride here. You can see the power; it is very low um, in terms of what we've been doing for the rest of this um, race. And this is where I'm already conserving for the sprint finish. Um, so everyone's and knowing up. and knowing that. The sprint finish is going to be a long one. It's going to be a long sprint. Um, and I'm probably going to have to do a lot of it myself. So when you say a long sprint, are you talking... Cause in time. Because yeah. this is the second last corner. Yeah. So the, so is it a I long already, sprint? I already said to myself from about five laps to go, position is going to be made here before you hit the downhill. Right. So it's really, it's not the last corner you want nah. to be worried about. It's this one here. Yeah, it's the second to, last. You've got to be in here with space and be ready to, to win the race. Um, and you also got to know when to react. You don't want to react and take some guy with you. So momentum into this corner and probably watching him off a bit of speed is important. You can see Paddy, I remember saying to him, I really need you to get through these corners quicker. Uh, really put the pressure on him to do that, um, with which he, he stood up, you know. He's doing a great job here. He's just got them all strung out. Yeah, and he's just keeping the pressure on. He knows we're in great position, so he's keeping the speed up, um, and that's been helpful for us to maintain our spot in the bunch. We've let a few people pass, and I've done that because Oric has finished. I know Caleb's on his own now. Um, well, I thought he was on his own, and then what we see here, we'll see... Um, the arrival of uh, Luke Durbridge, I believe. If this is is this lap twenty seven, no, yes. twenty eight, we see Luke Durbridge really come on, um, and at that point, it gets interesting. You still see the power is quite high there, but I think we'll find that next lap is pretty high. See, we're only hitting twenty five k's there as well. Yeah, we hit early in the stage. We we're hitting thirty plus thirty five. Yeah, that's also a very big sign of the fatigue that riders have. Um, taken on yep. in, in, in the race. So this Japanese team, he's, this, he's got great position here on your wheel. Yeah, he's wheel. riding well and he's, he's ridden smart and we'll see he does a good finish too. Um, he, this particular, I think it's, um, oh, I forget, he's Kanoki. Oh, well, there goes spot. Pat. Yeah, and, and he's done this positive move because we've just caught the break. This is the break we've caught now. So that's Chris Hamilton. That's um, also um, Luke Durbridge, who just followed that attack straight away. Um, this is Scotson that's come out of the break. Um, and then I think that was Paddy Lane there, and I was trying to get him to come closer into me so I could assist him to get back in the bunch, but I don't think he really wanted much bar of that. He sort of did his bit there. and um, Again, like I said earlier, I'm sitting around Lee Howard here. I know he's from Geelong. I know he'd really like to get a good result in today's stage, um, but also a guy that I really trust, um, trust in his experience. Um, you know, this guy's won world championships on the track, um, so he knows how to handle his bike. Um, so I'm confident he's going to be in the right position when it comes time. Um, so last lap, here we go, bell yeah, lap. Bell lap, and mainly I'm saying to myself, don't let someone past you that's not going to figure in this race. So I don't want to get passed by someone that I believe is not going to win. If they're going to win, they can come past because I know they'll get themselves into a good position for the finale. But if they're a guy that I don't trust, I really want to get away from him as quick as I can. So I'm still happy being on Lee Howard. I know Luke Durbridge is riding hard, really hard. Um, and we can see that power. Look, 900, 800 watts, 700, back to seven, nearly 800 again through the corner, 400. Um, these are high powers, and, and this is on the wheel. Um, and I now know that he can't maintain this. This is going to stop. And when it stops, that's when the reaction time. We're going to have a good rear view camera of uh, Spokes, who makes the actual, probably the winning move, really. He, he started it here. We can see he's getting ready. He comes back off the wheel a little bit, and this is his move now. And I'm obviously unaware of his move coming when it comes right now. It comes, we go front view. There's not a lot of room here, but this is it. I've got to go now, straight through the gap. Um, and probably two seconds, no, one second later, the gap wouldn't have been there. 
And I've just said to myself, I've got to go full gas. So 450, 480, um, still 450, 5, 600, 700. Back down a bit as I get into slipstream because I know I've gone past him. Uh, with speed momentum, I know people aren't coming past me here or they're going in the water. And then I'm saying to myself, don't crash. Now, 38 normally through this corner, 40, 41 this time, and then 1,000, 1,100. Yep. And then I look back here and I see I've still got 10 metres and I know it's happening today. And the best feeling ever. You. That's it. And you get a victory. Um, and just happy to cap off. A uh, really tough stage, the one that you know, everyone knows people want to win Port Arlington and never did I dream that I could have won Port Arlington. I know it's not a world tour event, but it's um, it's the hardest bay crit. And now I can put my name against a lot of really great riders that have won it. And I ran second to Luke Durbridge, uh, an amazing rider. And so to win it was fantastic. And then probably the best part about the whole experience the victory's fantastic, but this bit next is where it really means something, and this is when you really get your teammate, who he hasn't won, but he's part of it and he knows it, and they want you to know that they love it that you won, and um, that's great. That's something that unfortunately you won't experience in C and D grade, um, yeah, yeah. And, and, and it's something that probably makes us do it as hard as what we do because we get to experience that sensation those emotions, that rawness that makes you know, I can't get that sensation out of many other events in life, um, except probably family, um, which I also am lucky enough to get a lot of sensations out of that side as well. Uh, having a young family, young four and a half year old son and 17 week old daughter as well. Awesome. Um, so I think that's a refreshing thing for me too, that I get that non-cycling um, emotion as well yeah so when when that emotion does happen it means something because you're used to it yep yep um, pat shaw avanti iso way racing team thank you so much for your time congratulations on an awesome win mate and uh, i hope you have a fantastic year and hopefully we can do a few more of these videos yeah well look if you guys like it let us know and if you want me back i'll do it again um obviously this was some sort of stars aligning with we put the um onboard camera um thanks to shimano for supplying um and we won the bike race but we won the bike race because of those five other guys from the team as well and let's do it again